Hello, my name is Rolf Schneider. I'm going to give you a presentation in which I'm going to explain to you the background of Marchenko imaging. Perhaps you've seen our work that we did on this type of imaging. It is based on inverse scattering theory as originally developed for quantum mechanics and it allows us to image wave fields in a medium that we don't know. And we have realized that a lot of the work that we did, which has been fairly mathematical, was sort of difficult for, for many people. It has a large magic component to it. And what I'm going to do in this presentation is I'm going to give you a cartoon style explanation of how Marchenko imaging works. I want to add that this work is done in collaboration with my colleagues at Delft University, in particular Kees Wapenaar and Evert Slop. So let me first take you back to the 1950s. This was when Marchenko developed his inverse scattering theory. He wasn't interested in seismics, he was interested in quantum mechanics. And he worked on the following problem. Suppose we have a certain quantum mechanical potential V of X. And we send in a wave from the left. We send in a delta function from the left. We record the reflected waves. And our job is to reconstruct the unknown potential given the reflectivity R of T. And there's a very simple closed form solution for this problem. This solution is exact. And you, what you do is you solve the integral equation that you see here. You solve it for a fixed value of x. So you solve the, for this integral equation for the function k as a fixed value of x. And after you've solved this integral equation, you take this derivative and there you have your potential. This method is completely exact. There's no approximations involved. And it gives us a clear recipe to reconstruct the potential given the reflectivity. But this method does raise an interesting question. How is it possible that we, rec we can reconstruct our unknown model at a location x when we have recorded data at a location x is equal to zero without knowing the model between our measurement point and our reconstruction point? So this is the main question I want to address in this presentation. Why don't we need a model between the acquisition and the reconstruction points? And the answer really lies in Green's theorem. Green's theorem basically states that if we know a wave field on a boundary and we know the derivative of the wave field on the boundary, and if we know the Green's function, then we can compute the wave field everywhere in the interior. So we don't need to know a model to take the data from our acquisition surface to the interior of the medium. We just need to know the Green's function. So if we know the Green's function, we don't need to know a model. If we know the Green's function, we don't need to know modeling. There is no need for numerical modeling anymore. If we know the Green's function, we can do target-oriented imaging without knowing the overburden. And since we can construct the medium, the, the wave field everywhere inside the medium, we can stick this wave field into our wave equation and immediately get our medium parameters. So if we know the Green's function, we can immediately find the medium parameters inside our target area. Now I first want to show you two examples of where we can reconstruct the whole wave field. This is work that we did earlier with US Array data. This is a network placed in the western part of the United States. We cross-correlated noise recorded at the station indicated with the star, with the noise recorded at the stations indicated with the triangles. And that gives us the wave field that you show over here at two different lag times. And you can see that, the, that what we basically see is a circular wave front that emanates from the master station that is indicated with the asterisk. This, is, this method is called seismic interferometry and it allows us to reconstruct the wave field at every receiver as if it came from a virtual source that is indicated by the star. And since we now know the wave field everywhere in the, in the array, we can easily get the wave velocity everywhere in the array. But in a way we've been cheating here because we still have been able to measure the wave field in our medium. But I want to show you another example, which is taken from medical imaging. This is work done by Greenlee, James Greenleaf and co-workers. And they used magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, to make snapshots of S-waves that propagate through the medium. Here you see a snapshot taken in this way of an S-wave that propagates through an agar sample. You can clearly see plane wave fronts that are being distorted and the distortion is being caused by an inhomogeneity that, that they placed in the agar sample. But since you can take a snapshot of this wave field, you can stick this wave field back into the wave equation 
and you can get the shear stiffness of your sample right away. And I want to show you one other example of this. Uh, this here you see snapshots of the wave field of the shear waves that propagate through the biceps when the biceps is lifting different weights. When we don't lift weights, the biceps are soft, we get short, short wavelengths. And in the right panel, you see the biceps when the biceps is lifting 8 kilograms. And you can see that the, that the muscle stiffens up and therefore the wavelength increases. So, if we could find the wave field inside the medium, we could right away find our medium parameters. But now I want to come back to that question. Why don't we need a model between the acquisition and the reconstruction points? And I'm going to take you back to a paper by Bob Burridge, which he published in 1980s. On the horizontal axis, you see the uh, space location X. On the vertical axis, you see time T. And this is for a medium with a constant velocity equal to 1. And the dotted area tells us where the Green's function lives. So that means that if I put a source at X is equal to 0, the wave field is only non-zero in this cone that you see here. The physicists would call this the light cone. Now, I mentioned earlier the Marchenko equation, where we talked about this function k of x and t, and the striped area on the right gives you the support of this function k of x and t. Again, it looks like a cone, but the cone is rotated over 90 degrees. Now, what does this mean? This means that this function k of x and t can be interpreted as a right-going Green's function. It is only non-zero to the right of the source. And this sort of contains the answer of why don't we need to know the medium between our acquisition point and our reconstruction point, because the function that we are solving for is a different type of Green's function. I call it here a right-going Green's function, but in our work on the Marchenko imaging we call it a focusing solution. This is a wave field that focuses at the point of this cone. So, what we are doing in the Marchenko equation is we're solving for focusing solutions. And the focusing solutions tells us how the wave propagates between our acquisition points to the reconstruction points. Now, the Green's function that you see on the left and the focusing solution on the right are separated by the line x is equal to t, which is the direct wave that propagates through the medium. And this is the reason why in Marchenko imaging we still need to know the arrival time of the direct wave, because this direct wave demarcates the difference of the areas where the Green's function is defined and where the focusing solution is defined. So Marchenko imaging has been based on reflected waves recorded at the surface and an estimate of the direct wave that propagates through the medium. That means we still need to have a macro model for the velocity. Now the Green's function the data and the focusing solution are all connected. Here again you see the Green's function that I've shown you earlier. And the reflected waves are recorded at location x is equal to zero as a function of time. So the recorded data live on the red line. Those are the data R of t. Now on the right panel again you see the Green's function and the focusing solution indicated by the dotted and the striped areas. And with blue arrows, I indicate that there are relations between the focusing solution and the data. These blue arrows basically tell us how the representation theorems work that allow us to connect the focusing solutions to the reconstructed data. So why did it take so long for this whole concept of Marchenko imaging to become operational? I mean, the Marchenko equation was developed in the 1950s, and it's so 65 years later now. But in the physics community, the goal was completely focused on medium reconstruction. And in geophysics, we're much more interested in focusing of energy. And this connection was made by Jim Rose in the early 2000s. He wrote a paper, Single-Sided Autofocusing of Sound in Layered Materials. And to quote from his abstract, he addresses the question, giving single-sided access, how does one focus sound to a point at a specified time, given that the velocity profile is unknown? So I want to show you a numerical example of this that was created by Filippo Borgini at the School of Mines. He looked at an acoustic medium where both the density and the velocity were variable. They had discontinuities at different locations, as you see here. And we picked these examples because we had two medium parameters, but only one reflectivity. We asked our question, does the Marchenko equation still focus the energy inside this medium? I'm going to show you that this is the case. 
So this is the response that you get when you stick a source inside the, inside the inhomogeneous area. So this is the Green's function. You can clearly see the direct arriving waves. Now, in contrast to the work of Burridge that I showed you earlier, those waves don't propagate with a constant velocity because we picked a model where the velocity had variations. So the direct wave now lies on a kinked line. But again, the solution is only non-zero after the, the arrival of the direct wave. This is what we get if we apply the Marchenko equation to the reflection data recorded for this model. And you can see a pretty complicated wave field and I'm going to create some order in this. But the first I'm going to show you that at time t is equal to zero, the wave field focuses. You can see a cross section of this wave field at time t is equal to zero in the bottom panel. And you can see that the wave field is only non-zero at one location. We get a spike. But what we get here doesn't look at all like the Green's function. So let's analyze this a bit further. So I've drawn in the arrival time of the direct wave for positive times and I flipped it around in time. And now we see that on the left side of this, of this red line, the wave field is equal to the focusing solution. And to the right of this red line, the wave field is equal to the Green's function. That may not be quite obvious to you, but let me compare this to the figure of Bob Burridge that I showed you earlier, which I flipped around now. You can see that the striped area on the left is the focusing solution. The dotted area on the top on the left is the Green's function. That's exactly what we get if we solve the Marchenko equation. But how do we get the Green's function from this? Well, let's look at the focusing solution on the left side of the red line. You can see that it is anti-symmetric in time. Where I have a positive wiggle for positive times, I have a negative wiggle for negative times. And this gives us a recipe for taking this solution and converting it into the Green's function. Because what we do is we take this solution, we flip it around in time, we average, and there we have our Green's function. And to show you that we get the Green's function in the green box, I compare it with the Green's function on the left, which was computed by the numerical simulation. You can see that the two solutions are completely identical. And the reason for that is um, that the Marchenko equation ultimately gives us the Green's function for a virtual source inside the medium. So now this was all one dimensional. Let th let's take this to more dimensions and let's, let's discuss how these focusing solutions behave in more dimensions. So I, this is a typical seismic problem. I have an acquisition surface, which probably is the surface of the earth where we have sources and receivers. I have an overburden. And let's say I want to focus the energy at some specified location inside the medium. So the focusing solutions that the Marchenko equation give us basically take the wave field from the surface and they take it down to our target point. Now, what happens when we take this solution well, since there is no, no source at the target point, these wave fields continue to propagate in time. And when they propagate into the real medium, we see that the target point really acts like a downgoing source. Or stated in a different way, we are getting the Green's function of the waves that are radiated by our target point. And the beauty is that we don't just get the Green's function, we get the downward component of the Green's function. Now, in this whole process, all the internal multiples and all the surface-related multiples in the focusing solution are taken care of. So we get the full Green's function that takes all the multiples into account. So Marchenko imaging doesn't only give us the Green's function, it gives us, in fact, the upward and the downward component of the Green's function at our target point. And if you notice, then the Green's function takes care of downward continuation, it takes the data from our acquisition to our target point. I don't need to know a model of the reflectors because all the internal and surface related multiples are contained in the Green's function. This is completely target oriented. I can apply the method to any point in the subsurface. And as I'm going to show you next, I can use these upward and downward Green's functions immediately for imaging. And there's different ways of doing that. So here's the simplest way of doing that. I have a target point, and let's say this target point lies just above a reflector with reflection coefficient r. So here you see the upward and the downward component of the Green's function. And the upward going Green's function is related to the downward going Green's function by the reflectivity coefficient. 
and a phase that allows for the wave propagation from the target point to my reflection point. When the target point lies at the reflector, the phase term goes away, and you can see that the reflection coefficient is just the ratio of the upward and the downward component of Sogreen's function. To be more precise, the image is a deconvolution of the upward and the downward component of the Green's function evaluated at t is equal to zero. So that's one option to get a model for the reflectivity from Marchenko imaging. The second option is a little bit more complicated. We have our acquisition surface. I have a horrible overburden. You may think of a salt body. We have a target below. And I do the Marchenko imaging for every target point, every reference surface. So now I know the upward and the downward components of the Green's function at the reference surface. These upward and downward components of the Green's functions are related through a reflectivity that tells us how downward going waves at my reference surface are turned into upward going waves. And I can take this equation, it's an integral equation, and I solve it immediately for the reflectivity. This is called multidimensional deconvolution. Then I know this reflectivity, and the beauty is, is this is the reflectivity of the medium below the reference surface with a medium which is homogeneous above the reference surface. So now the free surface and all the horrible overburden has disappeared. One way to construct an image is to take this reflectivity, just evaluate it when the point x prime is equal to x and at time t is equal to zero, that gives me the reflectivity at the reference surface. So this is the second option for using Marchenko imaging for creating an image of the subsurface. The third option is to take this reflectivity and then apply any type of imaging or migration schemes to create a model of the su subsurface below the reference surface. You could do Kirchhoff migration, reverse time migration, it doesn't really matter. We've stripped away the imprint of the overburden, we've stripped away the free surface, and now we can take these reflected waves that are recorded at the reference surface to create an image below the reference surface. And this might be a very good way to proceed, for example, for subsalt imaging. So I hope that these cartoons have been helpful in explaining the principles of Marchenko imaging to you. I want to end by showing you a slide, giving you an overview of some of the papers that provide you with more information. I hope this was helpful and I thank you for taking the time to watch this video.